So I wanted to begin by first thanking everybody uh, for being here. This is a, an, an admittedly unusual APA conference, though for people doing virtual reality, it's this a kind of irony that we're meeting virtually, I'm sure. Uh, and I wanted to thank Andrew for the, <laughs> the last minute agreeing to, uh, agreement to be chair uh, during these, these circumstances. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you for helping to put this panel together. And what I thought would be maybe the best approach for me to take uh, on this panel would be to say something about what led me uh, to get interested in uh, the interactions between philosophy and virtual reality, in particular, uh, to say something a, a bit about what, uh, what virtual reality has to offer philosophy, but also what philosophical thinking might have to offer to people who are designing and developing uh, virtual reality simulations. And sometimes those populations overlap at present company included. And so I, I figured this would be the plan for my talk is to say something about what I've called the thought experiment paradigm uh, in other places and its relationship to moral psychology before uh, expanding on some ethical issues that I think are, uh, although not unique to virtual reality, especially prevalent in virtual reality, things having to do with um, experimental ethics, things having to do with uh, the way that we use virtual reality uh, to nudge or, or to engage in empathy enhancement, uh, and then just kind of closing by giving you a sense of what me and, and those of the people I'm working with in my lab, uh, what we're working on right now in terms of future directions, ways we, we want to expand our research program and, uh, and then close it. And so when I talk about the thought experiment paradigm, what I'm really interested in, I mean, I think philosophers have been really ingenious in terms of creating thought experiments that have all sorts of different purposes. Um, and when I critique the thought experiment paradigm, I'm not critiquing uh, most of these things. What I what I think what I've been really critical with uh, with respect to um, thought experiments is a specific kind of thought experiment that I've referred to as uh, perspectival thought experiments. And these are, I think, especially unique in terms of um, the role they play in moral psychological research. But but they find they find their way into into other strands of philosophy also. And so this was uh, my attempt to give you what I think is a kind of paradigmatic version of a perspectival thought experiment. So I wanna just read it uh, and then say something about it. You're standing near the railroad tracks and notice an empty box car coming down the tracks, moving fast enough to kill anyone that it hits. If you do nothing, the box car will continue along the main track, killing five people who are walking down the main track. There is a switch nearby that you can use to divert the box car onto either of two side tracks that split off from the main track in opposite directions. There's one person walking along the right side track. So if you flip the switch to the right, the box car will hit and kill this person. Your foot is stuck on the track on the left side track. So if you flip the switch to the left, you'll be hit and killed by the trolley. What do you do? And so on the one hand, this is obviously just a, a version of the trolley problem that we've been talking about a lot in this panel uh, as a kind of inspiration for, for our own work. But I think it's also an especially complicated version of the trolley problem, right? There are, there are multiple tracks. Uh, and really, for me, one of the things that makes this thought, this kind of thought experiment perspectival is the, the task that we're being asked to, to do in order to successfully accomplish it, right? So notice that in order to answer the question, what would you do? There are a lot of assumptions built in to this kind of uh, thought experiment about our capacities for uh, imagination, for perspective taking, and, and, and for making decisions from imagined contexts. And so I wanna, and, and I wanna say something about these particular features and, and why I think they're problematic. So when I talk about the thought experiment paradigm, this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about thought experiments that, that uh, have this kind of nature that are in a sense, asking us to do certain kinds of imaginative tasks. And I have them out on this slide. So on the one hand, to that, the, the assumption being that we are capable of imaginatively simulating the conditions of the thought experiment. I'm gonna go back to the slide uh, before just for a second, right? So imaginatively recreating this simu simulation, or sorry, this situation where there are these tracks where we are present in those tracks. So there's a perspective taking element uh, in terms of transporting ourselves into the relevant perspective. Uh, and then from that imagined position, making a judgment. I mean, sometimes we're asked to note our feelings uh, or, or to make other sorts of judgments of that nature. But, but they, so long as we're being asked to note something about what we would say under those conditions, uh, 
of successful simulation, then we have a perspectival thought experiment. And I think these kinds of thought experiments are problematic for lots of reasons, but in the moral psychological literature especially, it's because of what the outputs of these kinds of experiments are taken to be. Uh, in a lot of cases, we might use thought experiments uh, just uh, either pedagogically or um, just to clarify something. But in this case, perspectival thought experiments don't serve those roles. Really, their outputs are taken as new data, right? They're probative, meaning that they're, they're meant to help us settle or solve disagreements, right? So in metaethics, we might think like, oh, will this help us solve the internalism, externalism debate? Uh, or will this tell us whether the default position is really uh, a form of utilitarianism or something else, right? That there's that they're serving a probative role. And so here's one reason to think that this kind of thought experiment, um, especially when we're using it in this way and for these reasons is, is problematic. And it has to do with what we think uh, we're doing when we engage in these thought experiments and the kinds of capacities that are assumed by them. And in particular, uh, it's, it's, it's a certain kind of set of capacities for engaging in perspective taking. Uh, so Alan Goldman has written about uh, simulation in this sense as a form of perspective taking. Peter, uh, and and uh, Peter Goldie has written about something he calls in their shoes forms of empathizing that are perspective taking based. And in the context of perspectival thought experiments, I think we run, in, we run into a pretty serious problem about our ability to successfully complete them. And, and so in, in some sense, I think we actually should probably abandon perspectival thought experiments for moral psychological research. Uh, this is just to, to summarize what I think the problem is. Um, and, and I'm just stealing from Peter Goldie, so steal from the good ones, right? And in, in a sense, Goldie's issue with simulation of this kind, this kind of perspective taking, is that simulating the mental states of, of someone that's under situational pressures or whose character is different from our own is, is going to be impossible. So think about the situational pressures built into the Hubner and Hauser example, right? There, there's time limits. There might be uh, other sorts of internalized biases. There's, um, there's certainly emotional stressors that are acting on us in those situations. In those thought experiments where we're asked to, to imagine what it might be like to be somebody else, right? There's characterological differences and so on. And almost all perspectival thought experiments are going to have these. And importantly, the effects of these traits, situational pressures, character, and so on, are subdoxastic, right? They're, su they're non-conscious. They have their impacts on us insofar as they have them at all, uh, not by being a part of our conscious experience. And because mental simulation is an explicitly conscious and constructive process, those kinds of background features that are a part of our actual lived moral experience can't be simulated in the imagination without bringing them into the foreground and robbing them of their essential nature. Goldie has, has referred to this kind of stuff as fundamentally distorting the picture uh, of, of what it's like in essence, right? And I think he's right about this, that when we try to imagine the trolley problem, when we try to imagine even these uh, maybe more bizarre versions of the trolley problem, what we're imagining is a fundamentally distorted version of what would actually happen in our minds were we confronted with those situations. And so the data that we get out of vignette-based thought experiments, I think is not especially good if what we want is access to our real world uh, moral judgment mechanisms. So it's impossible, I think, to simulate non-conscious features of another person's perspective. It's impossible to simulate non-conscious features of our own perspective if we're in a different, if we're, if we're not currently or are currently feeling them in the moment, right? If I'm not under time pressure, then when I imagine what it's like to be under time pressure, I'm really not getting the first personal nature of time pressure. I'm just making a prediction. I'm probably gonna be stressed or something, but I'm not actually living that in the imagination and getting accurate data. So that, that's a problem if we think that thought experiments of this kind give us access to the mechanisms by which we make moral judgments. And this is one place where virtual reality simulations are actually thought to have a lot of promise. And I am one of these people, I think that's true. The problems with perspectival thought experiments, at least some of them, right? So at least some of them can be partially mitigated by offloading this task of simulation from the subject into virtual reality. So instead of trying to imagine what things look and sound like, what things, what, how I might be reacting to time pressure and so on, in a well-designed virtual reality simulation, I can confront those 
directly as I would with a real life experience. And this is just to, again, to quote from my betters, this is a psychologist, David Parsons, um, a virtual environment provides the researcher with an ecologically valid platform for presenting dynamic stimuli in a manner that allows for both the veridical control of laboratory measures and the verisimilitude of naturalistic observation of real life situations. So what's he saying? He's saying in essence, right, that if we construct a VR simulation of in, in, a, in the right way, and I'll say more about what I think that means in a second, then we can confront the, the, the uh, features of that simulated context in the same way that we would confront any actual real world context. And so if that's right, right, we don't have this background foreground problem anymore. We don't have to predict how we would react to time pressure or emotional bias or anything like that. Those will just have their role as they typically do in our real experience in a simulated experience. So we're just more likely to get better, more accurate models and a better, more accurate picture of our moral psychology using virtual reality instead of appealing to perspectival thought experiments. And in my own research uh, and in my own lab, what we've been doing in part, both looking at the extent research on, on uh, psychology of simulated experience, but also uh, mucking around creating our own simulations, is we, we're coming to some temp tentative conclusions about what we think matters in the design of VR simulations for this purpose anyway. And one of the things that matters is something that we call perspectival fidelity. Uh, I'll say more about all of these in, in, in just a minute. Um, another thing that we think matters is something that we call context realism. And yet a third thing that matters is really the subjects themselves. So uh, the first two, perspectival fidelity and context realism, are design features, meaning they're things that designers of virtual reality simulations have control over. We can control how we design for perspectival fidelity, how we design for context realism. Aside from screening your subjects, there's really not a lot you can do in terms of getting the right kinds of subject psychologies. And we can say more about what that, that means during Q&A uh, if there are questions. But yeah, there just seem to be certain kinds of psychological dispositions that make somebody more or less likely to treat simulated experiences as if they were real. And so VRE in that sense is a way of talking about virtually real experiences, which we think are really what, what we're after when we're posing these kinds of thought experiments, right? We wanna know what subjects would really do, how they would really judge, how they would really feel. And a virtually real experience is a, is a very special kind of experience that we think uh, is an experience that subjects treat as if it were real. So it's the best we can get in virtual reality in terms of getting access to real world, real life moral psychology. So I want to say something about these design features and then about the ethics of them. When I talk about perspectival fidelity, what I'm talking about is has nothing to do actually with the content of a simulation. Perspectival fidelity here is more about how designers of a simulated world choose to have that world present itself to its users, to its subjects. So for example, one feature of perspectival fidelity is that it's dimensional, right? So A can be more perspectively faithful than B while being less perspectively faithful than C. Uh, and its components are things like, for example, whether the content is presented in a first person pers perspective or something else, right? Some other kind of perspective. Whether things like the, the sounds uh, in the environment are diegetic or not, right? So whether they're generated naturally by the things in the scene or overlaid on top of it, right? So an instrumental soundtrack on top of your experience is not is less perspectively faithful than, than music being played by, let's say, a radio inside the simulation. Those of us who have used some of the earlier versions of VR head-mounted displays, for example, also know that the hardware itself can sometimes be really clunky. Uh, and if the hardware itself, if you have the headset on it, it's literally like you can feel it because it's weighty and so on. If it intrudes onto the nature of the experience itself, then that's less perspectively faithful and hardware that doesn't have that feature. Um, the degree to which the way that designers choose to have the interactions make use of haptics. So the more realistic the haptics in a simulation, the more sensory modalities involved, the more perspectively faithful that simulation is. Um, how designers choose to uh, control for locomotion in a simulation matters, right? So if I move around a space using a keyboard or using um, a handset joystick, that's less perspectively faithful 
for most people than if I literally get to move around a space in real life to move around a space in virtual reality. Now, there's a little bit of subjectivity there in the sense that different people are embodied differently. And so it, what matters here is that it, it matches the way the subject moves, right? So if I use some kind of mobility assistive device, then a simulation that takes that into account will be more perspectively faithful for that person. And as an example, just contrast this experience that I'm showing you here, which is a first personal experience of being in a kayak on a pretty quiet lake. I mean, the only real issue, one, it's, it's a static image, so that's uh, not how we experience things usually, but it's also screen bound here. Uh, and uh, it's one of the advantages of virtual reality, right, is that it's, it's fully immersive. And so the screen bound nature of most of our experiences like this are are less perspectively faithful. But otherwise, this is a pretty perspectively faithful representation. And when you compare it to something like this, you can see there's a lot of things in this simulation that make it less perspectively faithful. On the one hand, we've got a third person view instead of a first person view. And not only is, do we have a third person view, but it's, it's kind of situated up here behind the subject, uh, kind of floating in an impossible place in space. There are a lot of graphical overlays built onto the experience. And we don't yet live in this world where um, augmented reality uh, overlays things onto our everyday experience. So this is in, this is less perspectively faithful as a result. You can't hear it because this is a static image, but this is also, there's a soundtrack, right? There's a kind of heavy, like a sort of high, high energy soundtrack going on. You've got a mini map. All of these features make this simulation less perspectively faithful than this one. Context realism is a way of talking about the actual content of a simulation. And like perspectival fidelity, it's dimensional. So A can be more context real than B while being less context real than C. And so when we talk about context realism, really what, we, what we've been after is whether or not the simulation, its rules, the world that, is, that it's built in, its setting and so on, whether these things act the way that the subjects expect the world itself to act. Right. So how believable is this simulated world to the subject as a real world that that contains a lot of different things. Right. So, for example, one thing that seems to matter a lot is how virtual agents. So non-player characters act, how they behave. Do they behave in like very scripted robotic ways or do they present a convincing illusion of reasons responsiveness? They don't have to be full blown real agents. Right. They just have to kind of prevent a convincing illusion. Uh, for subjects to buy into that world. Does the rule let me do things like fly, which I can't do in real life, then it's less context real than, than it can be. Uh, do I have physical capacity? So can I, many video games, for example, just allow players to take massive damage that would kill anyone in real life, but of course in the game, it doesn't. Features like this, for example, uh, reduce the context realism of the simulation. Is it set in some kind of super distant or fantasy past or future? If so, then the simulation is less context real than one that's set in a more mundane everyday context, right? So this is just a way of thinking about the design choices built into a simulation. And as an example, um, I just wanted to give you, show, show you what, uh, maybe a, a direct example of what we have in mind. So on the left here is an example from uh, just a, a video game, Mass Effect Andromeda. This is less context real and perspectively faithful uh, than the example on the right. You can see it's third personal, there's graphical overlays, there's non-diegetic soundtracks, there's a mini map, it's set in a distant future, you're battling aliens, um, you can take damage that like would kill a normal human being and so on. So all the features of this simulation really add up to something that is meant to signal to the, to the, to the subject of this experience that it's not real and it's not to be taken as a real experience. On the other hand, contrast it. I'm going to play this short clip. It's about 30 seconds. Contrast it with this simulation, which is uh, a virtual reality exposure therapy simulation meant to help people who have fears of flying in an airplane, right? So if this had been a non-virtual APA, we would have all had an experience very much like this. But I just want you to note the differences here. Good afternoon. We will begin takeoff momentarily. Please pay careful attention to the following safety messages. Due to FAA regulations, this is a non-smoking flight. Please fasten your seatbelt by sliding the left fastener into the end of the buckle on the right. 
please leave your seatbelt on until the captain turns off the seatbelt sign. However, we recommend that you leave your seatbelt fastened while seated. In the case of a loss of cabin pressure, so you can see, right, in just even in just this uh, short clip, uh, everything about this is built to faithfully reconstruct both the perspective of somebody sitting in a plane, the the physical rules and uh, of of what would what it would be like to sit in the plane. The sounds are diegetic coming from the plane itself. The view out the window is naturalistic. The other people on the plane are behaving as we all know they behave, right? They're, they're on their phones, which is a nice touch, uh, and so. Virtual reality exposure therapy, I actually think is a, is a really useful case study for virtually real experiences. In that case, they're having a, they're being used for therapeutic effect, but what it takes to build a good VRET simulation is again, giving people control over the degrees of perspectival fidelity, over the degrees of context realism, so that subjects can, can have this therapeutic outcome. And just, it just contrasts very strongly to simulations like the one on the left. Now, virtually real experiences, they can have this therapeutic aspect. We also think that they can sometimes become morally significant uh, and, and, and that that's something that I think those of us who are wishing to work with simulations, uh, especially for moral psychological purposes, but even for commercial purposes, need to be more aware of and need to be more careful with when we design. So I want to show you another short clip. This is from now an ancient study uh, 15 years ago uh, that Mel Slater conducted um, He's in Barcelona, uh, essentially replicating Stanley Milgram's obedience studies, but using a virtual reality setup. It's a kind of hybrid of a cave and a, an augmented reality setup here. And so what we think happened in this study is that you really do get an unintentional combination of perspectival fidelity and context realism that resulted in virtually real experiences that were morally significant. So fair warning on this video, you're gonna hear a very convincing voice actress uh, simulate a woman being non-consensually shocked. Stop the experiment. She doesn't answer in order to take that as incorrect. I don't want to continue. Don't listen to him. You haven't answered. That's an incorrect response. Uh, no. Correct answer. Is All of them. Grass, flower, tree, soil. Flower. It's incorrect. I'm not anymore. And so when you get this combination of a perspectively faithful context real simulation, and, and why do I say it's both of those things? On the one hand, the perspective is actually built in because the user is providing their perspective, right? And it's, a, it's the person that's sitting there that's the subject. But interestingly, they're also, the way that they deliver the shocks is literally a physical set of switches. And so in that sense, they're getting the realistic haptic feedback of flipping switches because it's not a simulation of flipping switches, it's literally flipping switches. Uh, and the behavior of the virtual subject, uh, graphically primitive though it is, is realistic. Again, the voice acting is, is quite convincing. This is how somebody really would behave and talk and, talk and think and so on if they were being shocked. And so it's not surprising not only that Slater managed to replicate Milgram's actual data of getting two thirds compliance, but also that the subjects in this experiment really seem to experience some of the problematic ethical aspects of Milgram's experiment in this virtual space, right? And we think it's because of the generation of, of virtual, virtually real experiences in it. And we think this generates a kind of dilemma for those of us who, who do this kind of research. If VR simulations really do accurately capture the essential elements of a moral decision, then they might be problematic. They might be ethically problematic to conduct as, as I think the Mel Slater ex experiment was if they generate problematically virtual, problematic virtually real experiences. If on the other hand, VR simulations don't accurately reproduce the relevant situational features of a moral decision, then the ecological validity of the study is compromised and the data might fail to generalize to real moral, moral judgments, right? So if you, if you design an experiment that doesn't have these features, then subjects are just less likely to deliver judgments that would look like the judgments they would deliver in real life. And if the point of the experiment is to get more direct access to our real time, real world moral judgment mechanisms, then maybe, maybe uh, something like that just is gonna be less successful. Now, 
what I wanted to do with the time we had left is uh, say something about other ethical aspects of, of virtual reality that we've been working on recently. And one of them has to do with uh, using virtual reality for nudges or for nudging subjects. Nudges, if you're not familiar with the term, it's really just, this is Cass Sunstein. They're just interventions in a space, a design space that are meant to make it more likely that people do something, right? They steer people in a particular direction, as he says, while still allowing them to go their own way. Uh, one example is just a, a GPS device is a classic nudge, right? It gives you suggestions about where to go. Uh, of course, you don't have to listen to a, to a GPS device, but it's meant, to, it's meant to nudge you to get you to go somewhere. Similarly, people who um, design uh, uh, store layouts design the layout in such a way that it's meant to function as a nudge, right? It's meant to get a customer to have maximum exposure to all of the products to increase the possibility of spontaneous buying, right? It's a nudge. You're not being forced to do it, but the space itself is having an effect on you. And in the traditional way of thinking about the ethics of nudging, um, one way that the ethics of nudging is traditionally talked about is in terms of whether or not the nudge is transparent or the degree to which it's transparent, whether or not it respects uh, agent autonomy, whether or not it's good for the subject to be nudged in the way that's, that's being suggested. And although I'm not going to give this kind of full-blown account of nudge ethics here, I will say one place we've been interested in VR as a nudge vehicle is in this very recent trend to use VR as a, an empathy enhancing tool. And so here are just some examples of that, including the very, very disturbing middle one, um, just because it's moving. The, the top left there is an ex, uh, from a study by psychologist Sun Juan, and she was interested in having subjects play the role of a cow that's gonna be slaughtered right at a slaughterhouse. And the nudge there is that this simulated experience of being a cow at a slaughterhouse seems to affect people's behavior in terms of meat eating, for example, right? So it's, they're, they're nudged by it. Uh, simulations like the one in the middle are meant to give people a sense of what it might be like to be uh, pregnant. Uh, simulations like the one in the top right, that one is a simulation called autismity that's supposed to give people uh, some sense of what it's like to uh, experience certain kinds of uh, symptoms typical of autism. Uh, the three simulations on the bottom are all simulations meant to give you the experience of what it's like to be a person in a kind of marginalized context experiencing racial or ethnic bias, right? And so we have been quite skeptical of these. Um, in fact, this week, this article was accepted for publication where we, where we criticize nudges in this way. And what we're worried about is um, the degree to which VR can or can't accurately get you to share someone else's perspective. Unsurprisingly, we don't think it's possible. Uh, so I don't think it's possible for me uh, to get a sense, to get a real sense of what it's like to be, for example, uh, a black person experiencing anti-black racism through VR. There's just too much in the way that gets uh, given both my own history, how I confront the world, uh, my own internalized biases and so on that affect how I assess a scene that make it impossible for virtual reality to engage, to help me engage in that kind of literal perspective taking anyway. And um, in the interest of time, I won't show you the quotes, but a lot of the designers of these kinds of simulations are quite um, forceful that they think it literally allows us to engage in this kind of perspective taking. And, and we think it's unethical to paint these things in that way. And so in terms of future directions, one of the things that we're looking at is maybe shifting the target here from empathy to sympathy, that it might be possible to get people to have some of the benefits of uh, these VR empathy vehicles, but instead of giving them the false promise of understanding what it's like to be someone else, to actually get them to engage on their own terms with being what we call engaged witnesses uh, to, to certain kinds of incidences. So we're in the middle of trying to um, design and, and, and uh, test these sympathy enhancing VR simulations as a, as a possible counter to the empathy enhancing ones. This is one project that the pandemic has made very difficult to work on just because it requires us to, to meet remotely, but, but we're trying to get these out right now as well. And um, we're also interested in thinking about how these tools that we're talking about, how these concepts about perspectival fidelity, context realism, virtually real experiences might affect how commercial uses of virtual reality and augmented reality work. Uh, so this is just another paper we have coming out uh, later this year where we try to give a practical code of ethics for the, the use of the design of virtual reality simulations in a commercial context. 
And we're also partnering with uh, a local company here that's uh, Sisu VR. Um, this is the, their own uh, proprietary stuff. Uh, and they are working on, for example, trying to design virtual reality simulations to help it, with things like sexual harassment training in a corporate context. And so we're working with them to try and see how we can work on these design simulations, whether there are ways of controlling for some of these factors to, to have them have better long-term pedagogical outcomes. And so we think there's a lot of really interesting ways that both philosophers can help inform the design of virtual reality applications, the ethics of virtual reality applications, but we're also um, pretty convinced that uh, you can use these uh, to get just get much better data. These are just images from our own virtual reality simulations that we that we've made. The trolley problem, Judith Thompson's uh, violinist analogy, uh, the experience machine, uh, Peter Singer's uh, drowning child. Uh, this is a post experience machine debrief. This is a, a clinical ethics training software that we're developing. Uh, that we think really VR is is a really potentially explosive and transformative technology in terms of helping philosophers get better data about moral judgments, moral psychology, but also having philosophers try to help inform how this technology prospers and develops before we make some mistakes that uh, we'd rather not make. And so I wanna thank you for your time. I also wanted to acknowledge uh, everyone that works on this project, right? This is not my project. This is this is really a lot of people are working together to, to, to do this research, present company included. Um, and I look forward to, to uh, questions and, and conversation. Thank you.